No, I can't see anyone, but I just now got back on. Okay, well, sorry everyone that on my computer it didn't show that anyone was on here, so I just thought, well, maybe I've got, maybe I'm not on it proper. So I hung it up and I stopped and started all over again. But Mr. Smith said there was plenty of you on there. I don't know why that's not showing on my computer, and I don't necessarily know how to to um, to do that. I mean, I don't know how to see anyone's on there. And right now, I show there's two viewers on there. So, and maybe it's just people now getting back on. But I can see in the comment section. So if you comment, there's Brother Scott's on there, I see. So maybe now I'm going to be able to see whoever's getting on there. All right. Anyway, sorry for the confusion. Uh, first off, I just want to welcome everyone here. And... Um, um, I want to mention uh, this <clears throat> this Saturday we have a work day plan for the church and um, Brother Painter is saying if maybe we can have uh, several of the sisters come because we haven't had very much deep cleaning in the church for a long time if the sisters could come and then we're going to have a group of men working at uh, Brother Weaver's house or trying to get that house for them to move back in it so if uh, I guess if everyone would meet at the church then we'll get someone to lead them over to Brother Brother uh, Brother Weaver's house uh, we need some help over there and we're going to work while it's cool so if we can get meet at the church at 8 o'clock we can get started while it's cool because at Brother Weaver's house you know, probably no later than noon, probably we'll have to wind up that day over there. So if I can get a group of men to come and be over there, be there Saturday morning, we can get this done and, and maybe we can get closer to getting the weavers in their home. Excuse me. All right. Thank you. Oh, um, so I wanted to announce that. Of course, we will have church Sunday morning. Um, Bible study breakfast at 9.30 Bible study at 10 like normal and then band practice at 11 and church at 11.30 um, I do want to mention and ask everyone to please pray for Brother Mark Boyd and Sister uh, Boyd and Ethan Brother Mark's dad passed away of course and the funeral is um, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in Springfield. So please pray for that family, especially Brother Mark Boyd and his family, but of course also his brothers and sisters and his mother. Of course, it's very devastating when you lose a, a someone like the father of the family. So please be praying for that, uh, for that family. All right. Um, might say something to you a little bit here tonight about um, maybe something about our our existence. Um, you know the Bible says in uh, the thirteenth chapter of Revelations in the eighth verse, it says that um, Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, and of course that does not mean that. Jesus was, he wasn't slain before the world ever existed. It just means that, that that was already decided in God's plan before the world was even created, that, that Jesus would come to this world and be the lamb slain. He would be our, he would die on the cross for all of us, and he would come to this earth and become a human so that he could be a faithful high priest. That was in God's plan before he ever created anything. Even before he created Jesus. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do more study on it, but we used, you know, most men in the body taught at one time 
that G, that Adam was the foundation of the world. One time I was on my feet and I knew that and I even taught it because it's what I'd heard. But one time I was on my feet and I really had a good anointing and a good covering and just jumped out of my mouth that Jesus was the foundation of the world. And ever since that, I have felt like that it was possibly the Holy Ghost that spoke that through me, that he, everything was built on Christ. The whole purpose of the world was built according to God's plan on Christ. And so I will study that more, you brethren, study it with me. Uh, I'm not trying to change anything, but I just think that, you know, there's something to that. And uh, so if you'd help me, I'd like to, I think there's enough scripture. I just haven't uh, pursued that uh, thoroughly enough that I would just make that statement. I'm just telling you what happened to me. When I said that, I was in another man's church and I turned around and some men had kind of a weird look on their face, you know, because, I mean, I knew what they had been taught, but I just kept on going. It didn't it didn't slow me down any at all. Uh, then I want to mention uh, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Let me go there right quick. 1 Peter... Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, <clears throat> uh, he's talking to the, uh, Peter's talking to the churches there throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Then he says in verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. I just think that it's interesting that this elect was according to the foreknowledge of God, that God and Jesus knew, they knew everything from the very beginning. They, they had foreknowledge, and it's how uh, it's possible for everything to work together uh, for his people's good. Romans 8. Romans 8 says, 8 and 28 and 29 says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So God planned out the road of salvation for us in the very beginning. Uh, Paul said in, in uh, Ephesians 1, first chapter and verse 11, it says, in, it's talking about in Christ, we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, uh, I'll give you one more scripture in Acts 15, 18 says, uh, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world or beginning of the age. Well, this is, it's, this is not saying that every one of us were predestinated. You know, everyone that's saved was predestinated by individuals to be saved. That's not what this is saying, but it's saying that God's plan, he predestinated a plan. If he predestinated every one of us, that would do away with, with free, freedom of will. But see, that's the magnificent thing of God that he created man with a free will. Yet, God created a plan that man cannot overthrow his plan but God can elect not to be a part of his eternal plan. In other words, man could choose either way. Just like Adam in the beginning made a choice, knowing he knew he'd never experienced death, but he knew that was the penalty if he disobeyed God. And he chose not to obey God. He, uh, he knew 
He had a knowledge, but um, you know, he didn't. He did not choose to live according to the knowledge that he had. And it wasn't just knowledge. I think he had understanding to a great extent. And I think that, in other words, he fully knew what he was doing, and uh, he chose in his free will not to obey God. And so, you know, God God knew when he cho when he made man that there was a possibility of a fall. Doesn't mean that Adam would have had to fall, uh, although, I, you know, one of the things you almost have to give over concerning God, concerning trying to understand God, is that he knew everything. And I can't explain that. He's, it's just too high for me. But what I know about salvation is this. It, it, God is the one that is going to save me and lead me through a process of salvation. But I have to be willing to follow him and continue to seek him. Look what it says about, about uh, Jesus. Let me read to you in Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Um, and let's start with verse eight. It says, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things that he suffered. And then let me read verse seven above that. Who in the days of his flesh, when he offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him, his father, that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. See, Jesus, that's showing that when he was here in the flesh, he was tempted in all points as we are, and he had to be made perfect. He had to come a full age in God where he overcame the sin altogether. He overcame his will and did the will of God. Um, and, you know, I've said this before, and I think it, it, everyone ought to understand this that God is not a God that just wants you to do his will because he wants to be your boss. That's not God at all. God, he wants you to have your, your individuality. Or that is, just like you've got a fingerprint or an iris to your eye that is uh, uh individual it no one has it nobody has your testimony testimony you are an individual and a particular member in particular in the family of God and God doesn't want to take that away from you he just wants you to be righteous in all you do we have a great variety and it makes up a tremendous body of many many facets that are marvelous when God helps us to reach our growth stage of full age. Jesus, when he came to this earth, he had to go through a process. He, learned, he, would, he cried with prayers and, and uh, supplications and strong cryings and tears to his father who was able to save him from death because he feared that he was going to fail God. One time he said, I, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my feet didn't I slip. But when he went into the house of God and saw their end, that's what saved him. He, he was able to see there's no, there's no future in, in being wicked and prospering for a short time in this life, just like the uh, Moses. He, he uh, rather than to, uh, have pleasure in sin for a season. He chose to be with the people of God. So uh, there's pleasure in sin, but it's only for a season. And the judgment of it is horrible. You don't want being on the judgment of that. Um, let's see. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are his workmanship created 
in Christ Jesus, you might say recreated, under good works which God hath before ordained or prepared that we should walk in those good works. See, Jesus uh, were his workmanship and he before ordained that. In other words, God knew that he was going to lead some people were going to follow him. He knew that. He created a plan where he knew that he would have certain followers. May just be a remnant out of all that he created. That's what he's after. He's after, he's after a righteous people that will live above sin throughout eternity. Uh, the world will be cleaned up at that point. There will be no more separation, no sorrow, no death, no sickness, no, you know, I've said before, I don't even know why we would even need a house <laughs> because <clears throat> our house is protection from the elements. There ain't going to be any elements once God removes all of the, the curse. I, I, I don't know what that life's going to be like, but I can tell you this, with all the corruption that's in this world, I like life, especially serving God and having his protection in my life. So, um, uh, I'm, you know, I know I would like a life in God where there is no corruption. So I'm looking forward to that life. You know, uh, it's a life that we're, we're serving God to receive by faith. So you certainly have to have faith in God, but I've read enough of the Bible. I've read it, you know, when reading the Bible through years, after many years, you just, you see the corruption that's in man and you see that God, you see how God pleaded. Go back and read the book of Jeremiah, how God pleaded with Israel and with Judah to please turn back to him so he wouldn't have to send them into captivity and destroy that nation, their nations they wouldn't hearken to him. And so he did exactly what he told him he'd do. And then, but he said, I won't make a full end of you. I'll get you in a place where you're willing to serve me again. And then he brought them out of Babylon after 70 years, restored the, the, uh, the temple and restored Jerusalem and the nation. And, uh, but you know, the story, they got in trouble with God again, wound up under, uh, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome, and uh, only a remnant of them was saved after even Jesus came to this world. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's just not possible that that Adam's race um, could inherit eternity. They must be everyone individually transformed spirit, soul, and body. Um, uh, somebody said in the meeting that we just came from in the campground that, and I thought it was a really good statement, that there's only one race. There's no such thing as raci racism in the body, or shouldn't be, because there's just one race. It's the human race. We're all of Adam. It don't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what culture you are. We all derive from fallen Adam. It's the human race. We're all of the same race. And, uh, you know, so we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have, uh, we've got to overcome racism. It is, you know, it, it, it affects all of us. It affects all of our life, you know, where we come from. But in the body of Christ, you have to grow to the point that you realize that there is no difference. There, the, you know, there's equality in all cultures and all races concerning their ability to fit into God's eternal purpose and God's eternal plan. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all with open say, face beholding in in a glass, the glory of the Lord are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit, even by the Spirit of the Lord. So 
In other words, we're changed. We're going from one glory or one growth stage in God spiritually to another until we finally um, uh, you know, uh, reach that, that place of full age. 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God has ordained uh, a plan that some, not all, might come unto eternal glory or with him. Uh, Romans 9 says, uh, verse 23 says, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. See, God, God determined this before the world was. Can you imagine you and I were included in God's eternal plan? his eternal purpose, God planned that some, and if you have, if God, you remember Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draw him. If, if no man come to God except father draw him, the only reason you're here is because God, God found you and found a quality in you that was uh, available to him to save. He saw an ability. He saw it was able to save you. And that's why he drew you. And he's been working with you ever since. So uh, Jesus said, you know, he said, many are called, but few are chosen. You remember what I've said about that. Let me turn to Revelations 19 and see if I can give you that, that verse where <clears throat> um, let me see if I can get this is that in the 19th chapter that those that were with Jesus were uh you know, he came on a white horse. And those that were with him were the called, chosen, and faithful. Well, I've always said that this way. I've said that um, uh, that when you're called is when God starts dealing with you, when he starts wooing you. God's calling you. He's calling you to his plan. And then when you yield over to God and you say, yes, Lord, I want to be saved by you. I want to be a part of your plan. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I need help. I know that. I need you. I feel you wooing me. I feel you calling me. And I'm my answer is yes, I will obey you. I will serve you. I'll turn my life over to you. I'm yielding over to you. You're the creator. I need it. I've always needed to follow you. I want to know more about you. When you do that, you are chosen of God. When you say yes, God says, I choose you. I'm calling you. I'm asking you to make the right decision. When you do, he, he chooses you. And then as long as you keep doing that, you are faithful. And if you'll be faithful to the end, you know, if you'll serve him to the end, uh, you'll, you'll make it. You'll be made righteous. And so, but there's things God don't tell you when he first calls you because you're not able to receive it. Remember Jesus told his disciples, I have many things to say to you, but you can't receive them right now. Well, um, uh, but, and, and as you serve God, things will happen that puts you in a crossroads. Am I going to go on with God? Am I going to be faithful and continue to serve him? Or am I going to say, no, this is where I get off? See, once you say no to the Lord, you're no longer chosen. You go back to being called. 
you're his child. He will never leave you or forsake you and never quit calling you back. But he won't make you serve him. He's got a right. You're his child, so he can, he can chastise you. He can spank you. He can, just like he did Israel. Now, Israel went through way more than the rest of the world went through because God was trying to save them. They were his chosen, his elect. You're his chosen. You're his elect. So he's going to try to save you. You're his child. He's got a right as a father to try to chastise you, correct you, do whatever he has to do to save you. But in the end, he will let you go. He will not override your will. He's not going to make you serve him. He may make you give in some, but ultimately God is not going to force you to be righteous. He can because he gives you a free will. And so, um, but if you say it went, if you'll say yes, every time you hit that place of crossroads, he will, you will remain faithful and you, you'll remain his chosen and faithful person. So, so when you're born, you know, into this world, it's not determined whether or not you're going to be a, a sheep or a goat. Uh, uh, the, the wicked are going to be gathered of God and the, and the wicked are going to be ultimately, they'll be destroyed. Proverbs six fourteen says, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. See, God created man that some men's going to turn away from God and be evil. God created that for the day of evil because there's a, a day of evil and judgment that's taken place. This world's corrupt. And there's a lot of evil people in it. God created them. Either part of God's nature, God's creation. And um, uh, so, so God's got this eternal plan. Uh, it says, if Revelation 4, 11 said, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Paul said, in, uh, again, and I mentioned in, in uh, Romans 8, 29, he said, uh, he also did predestinate us to be conformed to the image of his son. It's his plan that has been predestinated, not which... Uh, not that people have been, well, that people have been predestinated for life or death. In other words, if you fit into God's plan, you do his will, he has, it's been predestinated that he would take you, as long as you'll be faithful, he'll take you all the way, all the way to be conformed to the image of his dear son. If you turn away from God, he predestinated that in, ultimately you'd, a person would be destroyed. Uh, it's the plan. In other words, it's been predestinated, uh, not which ones have been predestinated to life or death. Um, let's see what else I want to say here in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. See God says over and over. He lets it be known how it's going to come out. God's plan is going to be fulfilled. A person could be a part of a God's temporary plan. You know, we've always said, like we said, uh, uh, that in this building, sometimes we have a, we're, you know, like when you're building a natural building, you have an old board that's crooked. And, uh, you know, in the body, if we use that scenario, well, we call that the old crook. That's a person that comes in. They're, they're not, they, they just won't do right, but they help. 
Maybe they pay their tithes. They come to work days. They help build. They don't cause trouble too much. But they're, they're in on the building project but we never found out, figured out where to put them in the building because they can't become a permanent part. That's old crook. I've had several old crooks in my ministry, but sometimes you take an old crook and you can trim that old crooked board down. You get all the crookedness out of it and find out what's left and cut that down and find a place where it fits in the building and it can be a part of the building, the everlasting plan of God. So uh, I don't want to be an old crook, but if I've been one, well, I'm just hanging around till God gets me trimmed down where I'm going to fit somewhere. I hope I already do. Um, Uh, in Acts 17, let me give you that scripture. God, verse 26, has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So it would remove God's free will from our race if God planned who's going to be perfect and who's not. In other words, God just decided one's going to be saved and one's not going to be saved. I think some people are born, you know, they're just born of their mother and their father. There's some people God actually did predestinate them. Like for an example, Jeremiah, I believe that the scripture says, God said, I knew you before you were in the womb. And he was called a prophet before he even was in the womb. So God, God decided to cause that his mother to have a little baby boy that God was going to have as a prophet to fit his timing and his plan. Now I didn't mean that prophet would be saved eternally. It just mean, it just meant that God chose to have a prophet out of that woman. And I suppose if he'd have went bad, God would have just chosen another. But Jeremiah was a great prophet of God uh, in his day. But everybody has to go through the redemption process. Remember that. Nobody escapes that. Even Jesus had to go through it. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit and through the belief in truth. See, it's just part of God's eternal plan that he knew I'm going to have people, I'm going to eventually have people of all walks of life be a part of my eternal plan. Um, so anyway, um, so you'd have a hard time here with scientists that, you know, they think everything come through the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> uh, it's, it's ironic that anybody could believe that or know anything about God. Acts 17, 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being. We, nothing is except God brought it into existence. Nothing. All of the universe, all of the galaxies, every planet, every star, every newborn star. God is a well a knowledgeable about everything in the entire heavens and the earth and in every man. God knows everything. Uh, I, I, I can't explain the greatness of God that he can do that but the Bible declares it. And of course, I can't believe that there's anything less of our God when you look at his creation, when you look at all what God's done. Men think, you know, even today, men think this world's just gonna keep going. They don't think there's gonna be a judgment. 
the Jews didn't realize there's going to be a judgment in AD 70. They didn't, you know, everything they've been through, they didn't realize it because they were wicked. They weren't close enough to God. There's men today that are so wicked that they just keep believing that this world's going to keep going on and on and on. But I'm just going to tell you, the Bible tells us the battle of Armageddon's coming in the end of the Gentile world. And when you look at the corruptness, when you look at America, it just makes me sick. That when I was a little boy, this nation was far more righteous of a nation. Our government officials were far more God-fearing men. We've had many Christian presidents that feared God. You know, for a long time, Billy Graham uh you know, even though he was an evangelist, there were still presidents that that counseled with Billy Graham. They were still concerned about where we were at in God's plan. I mean, they don't they don't even think about that today. In fact, they don't even think, you know, most of our nation they've turned away from even Christians have turned away from God. Christianity for the most part has super Officially, it's superficial what they believe and what they teach. It's not biblical. Many, many things that have to be corrected for us to get on the right path with God in America again. I, I'm not saying that there's not men that are on the right path, that are not on the right path with God, but I'm just saying the majority isn't. I can just tell you that or this world wouldn't be in the condition. Our nation wouldn't be in the condition that it's in. Uh, let me look in Psalms 139. It begins with, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. It concludes in verse 23, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. In verses 7 through 12, it says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell or the grave, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea or the world, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. If I say, surely, the darkness shall hide me, even the night shall be light unto me. See, if you're a child of God, you can't get away from him. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day and the darkness as the light are both alike to you. Uh, verse 13 through 17 says, you form my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I'll praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You ever thought about the human body, the magnificence of the human body? Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. You were, you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth in the dark of the womb. Huh. Your eyes shall saw my substance, yet being unformed in your book, they all were written the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. Job 12 says, verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Psalm 66, 9 says, God keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. Luke 20, 38, for he's not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. That is all of his children. Luke 28, 38, for he is not the God of the dead, but the living for all live to him. John 5, 26, 
For as the father has life in himself, so he granted the son to have life in himself. Colossians 2, 9 says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the, of, of the deity really exists. So in him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God dwelt in him. God gave him life unto himself. The universe, as I said, was accomplished by the Son of God. Christ is the one who God created everything. That's in Colossians 1. So um, 1 Timothy 6, 15, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who alone can never die, who lives in light so terrible that no human being can approach him. No mere man can ever live him nor ever will, ever, ever see him. No mere man has ever seen him nor ever will. That's a different translation, but it makes it plain. John eleven twenty five 25 says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Anyway, I just thought I would mention these things about, the, about God's predestined plan, God's eternal purpose, God's eternal plan. Created it for his own will. Uh, don't you know God's looking forward to having a righteous family? throughout eternity. Don't you know God, don't you know that God sees all of the so many facets of people that's been perfected in righteousness that brings such a variety to an entire family? There is no telling what God has prepared for us throughout eternity. There is no telling what we're going to enjoy throughout the ceaseless, endless ages of time. I'm going to tell you, saints, the older I get, the more I know him, the more I love him. The sweeter he gets. That song says, it gets sweeter as the days go by. Wow, what's it going to be like when we enter into a realm that it's, I don't know what it's going to surpass. It'll surpass anything we know anything about. I don't know about all the nation, the, the, the planets. I don't know about all of the heavens. I don't know about all what God's got planned. I just know it's going to be marvelous. I want to be a part of it. God bless all of you. Please remember Sister Julie Crafton in prayer. She's had a stroke, you know, and she's going through therapy. She's back home now, but it's very difficult for her to go through, you know, the struggles of getting the use of her left arm back and uh, just everything that a stroke, you know, really has affected her. Pray for her family, her husband, Brother Michael Crafton, uh, Brother Josh and Sister Amber and Sister Wilson. Uh, pray for or Joe, uh, their other son, Joe Lacey, uh, Sister Ruth, and uh, uh, Brother Sister Durham's daughter, Joe, Sister Lacey's son. Pray for that family. Pray for Brother Ray Weaver. We're trying our best to get their home where we can get them back, move back into it. Pray for Sister Holly. She's been so gracious to let them live in her home now going on two months while we're trying to get this house that caught on fire and burnt part of it. And we're trying to get it livable again for them. So pray for the brethren this Saturday. We've got a crew working, trying to get them, uh, get the church, I mean, their house back in a, a livable condition. Pray for us. And God will give us favor to get that done. They need a lot of prayer. Brother Bill Daniels. He's got a condition in his body where he just keeps taking on fluid and congestive heart failure. And he's got a real low point of B12 in his body for some reason. I'm praying that God will heal him completely. I need Bill Daniels in my church. He's a great man of God. I need all the men of God that God's given us. I, God needs them. I, I, you know, I, I say I need them, but 
I do feel a great need for them. They're part of our makeup in the Little Rock Church. Uh, let's see, who else? Sister Cindy, my daughter-in-law, Michael and Cindy's, Cindy's mother, Sister Angie Elder. Pray for her that God would touch her. Uh, Michael and Cindy have her right now in their home and are trying to help her through this time and in her life. Pray that God will help them and that God will touch her body. You know, you don't have to get sick to die. You can just live up till you get to whenever God's ready to take you and just go to sleep in your sleep. So what'd be wrong with that? I don't necessarily want to get sick to die. I'll just live till God gets ready to let me go to sleep. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? That's what we all would like to have. But sometimes, you know, Brother Leninger used to teach that we have to go through a fire sometimes in the end of our life. God has to take us through that a purging that that helps us, prepares us for the best resurrection we can get. Uh, I'm hoping God will help me get prepared for that, that I won't need too much fire. God help me, you know, I'd like to serve God out of a willingness, not 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 God having to have to prod me along. Uh, let's see, who else in our church needs prayer? Sister Wilson needs prayer. I mentioned her. Uh, let's see. Just, you know, pray for our church and the needs. Pray for Brother Bud's works. Uh, for the most part, they're doing well, but we do need, you know, we need God to continue to help them. Anytime a great man and leader dies, it 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 causes confusion and trouble. And and uh, so pray for Nacogdoches and Sebastopol and Brownsville and then the works there in South Texas mission and uh, also the works in Mexico, all of them. Uh, real Bravo. Uh, Brother Rodriguez has got a work in Matamoros and Reynosa. And, and then there's works in Monterey and down Brother Memo Cano and Veracruz and, and Tampico and uh, just help them pray. I mean, help us pray for those works. When I when something happens to me, I want y'all to be praying for the works that I'm, those that I'm trying to help in the gospel because they're worthy of it. They've received this. Pray for the Dominican Republic. Brother Emilio Green, he needs your prayers. Brother Leo Ciprian, Brother Calderon, those are three leading men over there. Brother Rudy and Brother Jackson, Brother Sinane, Brother Francisco. Those are pastors that we have over there, Brother Israel. All right, God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Uh, I'll see you Sunday. And uh, let's see. All right. Uh, let's see who else we may have here. Brother David Paul from Montreal. Brother David Paul, God bless your heart. We're glad to have you. Brother, Brother Ismay Toussaint Fidel from Guatemala City, Guatemala. Good to have you, Brother Brother Fidel. All of you that are uh, on tonight, I, I can't see everybody uh, because it's just the way that my, I, if there's a way to see it, I'd have to, I guess Sister Ruth Ruth Calderon, she's on here from the Dominican Republic. God bless you, Sister Ruth Esther. It's good to, we're glad to have you, Brother Painter's on. Uh, most of our saints, I'm sure, are on. So anyway, God bless your hearts. Have a good night. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you.